Jerome Savonarola A Sketch by the Reverend J. L. O'Neill, O.P. Published in Boston by Marlier, Callanan, and Company in 1898. First Part 1. Ancestry and Early Days of Savonarola On the 21st of September, in the year 1452, was born the most illustrious citizen of the ancient Italian city of Ferrara, Jerome Savonarola. The family of Savonarola was of Paduan extraction. Jerome's grandfather, Michael, was a celebrated physician in Padua, where for two hundred years his ancestors had won distinction and esteem. The fame of Dr. Savonarola induced Nicholas III, Lord of Ferrara, to urge his coming to that city. He accepted the invitation, and as physician to the prince, took up his residence at the court. Of his son, Nicholas, the father of Jerome, nothing notable is, recor is recorded. A shiftless man, a physician without ambition, but an acceptable follower of the court. He failed to share the renown attaching to the name of Michael, who was justly distinguished for his medical writings as well as for his skill in practice. Jerome was one of seven children. Of his earliest years we have few particulars. Neither playful nor pretty, he was a grave child, studious, devoted to his mother. These are the characteristics that most deeply impressed themselves on observers and biographers, and they sum up the exterior child life of this remarkable man. As he entered upon his growing boyhood, the seriousness of the child deepened. He soon recognized the vanity and pomp of a society which was largely pagan in its refinement. He conceived such an abhorrence for it that, having once been brought to the duke's palace, he resolutely declared that he would never again visit the place. Study and prayer filled his days, while meditation made more firm his increasing conviction that the times were evil. His parents intended him for the medical profession, but divine providence had otherwise ordained. In the learning of his day, Savonarola made rapid progress. As for Berlamachi, afterwards his religious brother and disciple, tells us, he worked night and day. The philosophy of Aristotle and of Plato he diligently read, follow, following these by an ardent and enthusiastic study of the angelic doctor. While he thus enriched his mind, devotion and piety shone in his manner and conduct, the fruit of the growing charity which his tender heart glowed. Fidelity to his books prepared him for that wider and deeper research which came later, in reading the lessons of the human heart. Full of sympathy as he witnessed squalor, suffering, and ignorance, side by side with luxury, indulgence, and pagan culture, his soul burned with righteous indignation against the irreligious and unchristian spirit which was dominant, and with tender pity for God's neglected poor. As the gulf, already broad, grew wider and wider, the rich becoming richer and the poorer poorer, his spirit cried out in the crude but impassioned verses which he entitled, On the Ruin of the World. 
To him the whole world seemed awry, virtue and piety having disappeared, sin walking abroad without shame, bloodshed and rapine triumphant, the widow and the orphan despoiled, Christ scorned, and heaven defied. Savonarola was then only in his twentieth year. We may easily credit Father Merchazzi when he tells us that at this time the youth found pleasure in the woods, in lonely places, walking in the fields or by the river's bank, singing plaintively or weeping, thus giving vent to the emotions which surged in his breast. For an account of an interesting incident of his this period of his life, we are indebted to Fe Father Benedict, one of his disciples at St. Mark's, who learned from the Master many details of his youth. Living near the Savonarola homestead in Ferrara was a Florentine exile of the noble house of Strozzi, whose daughter attracted the attention of the gloomy young poet. A sudden attachment sprang from this, doubtless a passing emotion of fancy, under the influence of which Savonarola declared to the lady his devotion. We may judge the just indignation with which he met her haughty rejection, her cutting announcement that no Strozzi would stoop to an alliance with a Savonarola. This shattering of his hopes, this disappearance, as he then thought, of all light and sunshine, was the happy occasion of his turning more completely to God. The piety which he had always cultivated now urged him to an absolute abandonment of the world. He did not act hastily, but considered the, long, the matter long, seeking guidance through prayer. When he was twenty-two years old, as he mentions in one of his discourses, and as Pico della Mirandola, Berlamacci, and Father Benedict also record, he heard a sermon delivered by an Augustinian friar. So deep an impression did this teacher make on him that his resolution was at once formed to leave the world and join a religious order. His love and admiration for St. Thomas Aquinas determined his choice of the order of preachers. Nevertheless, another year passed before he effected his purpose. During this time his tender heart suffered unspeakable anguish, for the delay was entirely due to his fear of inflicting pain on his father and mother by announcing to them his purpose of retiring to a monastery. Two, the cloister, ideal of the religious life, 1475 to 1481. The struggle was ended in 1475. On April 24th, being then in his 23rd year, Savonarola stealthily left his home and, and set out for Bologna and St. Dominic's where the sacred relics of the patriarch lie enshrined in the noble and exquisite tomb wrought by Niccolo Pisano, the cradle of modern Christian art. Savonarola's earliest ideal was the religious life in its simplest form, the work and lowliness of a lay brother seeming to him the more attractive. This erroneous notion was dissipated by the fathers of St. Dominic's who pointed out the student that the career to which he was called was that of the priesthood. In the retreat at Bologna, Savonola spent seven happy years. Prayer, fasting, mortifications of the most rigorous kind filled his days. At the same time his modesty and obedience proved how truly he had separated himself from the outer world. During this period he lectured to the novices, composed a compendium of philosophy, 
and wrote commentaries on Plato, his previous philosophical and theological studies having laid a most solid foundation for the vast learning which he subsequently acquired. Early in his religious life, his meditations, which be before his coming to Bologna had found expression in the canticle or poem, already mentioned, on the ruin of the world, bore further fruit in a second metrical composition, which he styled the ruin of the church. Brooding over the unhappy condition of his beloved Italy, for Savonarola was no mere provincial, witnessing a period whose annals, annals deal frequently with treachery, cruelty, bloodshed in war, in riot, and in assassination. His gloomy forebodings were further embittered as he beheld the relaxation in morals, the scandals in ecclesiastical life, the decay of the faith, the numerous disorders which afflicted, afflicted the church. In this canticle, on the sins prevailing among the faithful, his ardent soul pictures with a somber vividness the evils that had already come, and the misfortunes that, as a necessary consequence and punishment, which would follow in their train. He describes the church in solitude, mourning the overthrow of her chaste edifice, spending her days in tears because of the havoc that had been wrought. His inflamed imagination beheld the evil spirit as a horrible vampire that had spread its great wings over the prostrate form of the church, from which it gradually drew the life-blood. Then, as if wrapped in an ecstasy of indignation, the impetuous young friar poured out the longings of his soul, for the beauty of the house of the Lord, and for the honor of the place where his glory dwelleth. O God, O Lady, give me that I may break those spreading wings, that I may slay this monster, that I may lift up and restore your beloved church. His gracious Lady bade him be silent, to pray and weep. With swelling heart he obeyed, giving himself to the life of the cloister in the fullest devotion of his generous soul. Thus restrained by the Spirit of God, and yielding to the empire of grace, he vigorously devoted himself to the vocation with which he had been honored. Three. Arrival in Florence, 1482 History is silent as to the time of Savonarola's first appearance in the pulpit. Even the date of his ordination is not given by his biographers. Certain it is, however, that while in Bologna his superiors directed him to preach. What effect these discourses had on his audience we know not. Apparently he did not achieve any notable success, for contemporary chronicles make no mention of his efforts. In 1481 he was sent to Ferrara, his native city, where for a time he preached, but without any special influence. Apart from a lack of polish that many of the cultured hearers of those days considered more important than doctrine, his want of success may have been an illustration of the old proverb that a prophet is not without honor save in his own country. So, at least, Savonarola thought. During this year, the closing of the University of Ferrara, the faculty of which included several members of the Dominican order, was the occasion for the withdrawal of some of the brethren previously assigned to the convent of that city, 
Savonarola was sent to the Tuscan capital, destined afterwards to be the scene of his triumphs and his sorrows. He never again saw his native place. The contemplation of the misfortunes which threatened Ferrara and all Italy through expected war stirred the souls of the anxious friar as he began his journey to his new home. We know not whether the gloom of his reflections was brightened by the beautiful panorama which opened up before him in the very heart of the golden land of Italy, as he gazed, for the first time, on the lovely valley which fair Florence, divided by the river Arno, sat gloriously enthroned, and solemnly guarded by lordly Apennines. Nor we may judge whether, as he had entered the noble convent of St. Mark, a prophetic inspiration fell upon his soul, or coming events cast their shadows in the hopes that must have dwell swelled his generous heart while he thought of his new and extensive field which awaited his labor and zeal. The name of St. Mark's is forever linked with the history of Florence and the career of Savonarola and with the memory of the Medici for it was Cosimo the Elder who built and endowed the convent at a heavy cost, and there welcomed the Dominicans in the year 1443. To this great man the brethren were further indebted for a magnificent library, which was practically the first public library founded in Italy. The friars of St. Mark's were men of learning as well as piety, and under their fostering care, especially in the golden days of St. Antoninus and Fra Angelico, St. Mark's became the center of Christian culture in Florence. Only twenty-two years had elapsed since the death of the gentle archbishop when Savonarola entered the convent, whose walls were all alive with the speaking figures of Angelico's lovely saints and angels, and with the glory of paradise itself, and whose chronicles were enriched with the story of his brother Dominican artists, learning in art and sanctity, therefore, greeted the young friar from Ferrara, and bade him welcome to his home of religious and true Christian erudition. Beyond its peaceful, peaceful cloister there arose the din and strife of politics and of contending philosophers. Not only were purely religious studies neglected, but even the pursuit of a full and genuine profane learning was neither serious nor dignified. Lorenzo the Magnificent discussed Plato with his followers and then passed to the composition of obscene carnival ballads and rhymes whose merits his psychophantic courtiers lauded beyond the immortal song of Dante. Such was the standard among the men who venerated everything ancient, who regarded the discovery of a Greek or of Latin manuscript as one of the greatest blessings of heaven who extravagantly extolled the classics, and endeavored, through a blind imitation of Greek and Latin writers, to establish a neo-pagan literature. The so lamentable a measure of life among the higher classes, accompanied as it was by much immorality, induced a corresponding degradation of the people, vice, it may be said, was too often unchecked, unrebuked. The carnival was not a mere diversion preceding Lent. It was a prolonged dissipation in which lewd displays and ribald songs, some of the latter composed by Lorenzo, were a large part of the program. 
The contamination of public manners was a necessary consequence of these entertainments. Halam, speaking of Lorenzo the Magnificent, whose patriotism he could not praise as disinterested, declares that he completed the subversion of the Florentine Republic for which his two immediate ancestors had prepared, the mockery and pageant of forms having alone been preserved by him in order to keep up the illusion of liberty. A student of Tacitus, Lorenzo realized that, in the imitation of the Roman Emperor Augustus, the most effective way to carry out his purpose of enslaving the people was first to corrupt them. Nor had he read the life of Pericles without learning the same lesson from an Athenian tyrant. It is not, therefore, surprising that the political condition was deplorable among a people whose republican institutions had previously and successfully resisted oft-repeated shocks, but who now seemed, with few exceptions, dead to all thought of freedom. Verily, the proud Catholic Republic had sunk low when Savonarola began his labors among the Florentines. Four. Beginning of Savonarola's career as a preacher and missionary, 1482 to 1489. It required but a short time for Savonarola to appreciate his new surroundings. Occupied with the instruction of novices, he had, however, no opportunity of appearing in the pulpit till the Lent of 1482. In these few months of preparation were providential. They enabled him to study the difficulties of his position and served as a judicious speck, a check, on what may have been a rash precipitancy had he spoken in the first fervor of his indignation. Seeing how the Bible was held in high, slight esteem, having been superseded by Plato and Aristotle among the many of the learned, he gave himself with renewed determination to study of the scriptures, inculcating at the same time a like devotion on the part of his novices. The divine word was indeed his armory. During all the succeeding years of his preaching he invariably made the holy scriptures the root and basis of his discourses. Disregarding the prevailing method of address, and speaking from his big honest heart, without quibble or subterfuge, seeking neither to please cultivated ears, nor to win pagan applause, he began his Lenten sermons in the church of San Lorenzo. His earnestness, his fire, his wealth of scripture learning and comment, were all lost on the Florentines who came to hear him. Their sense of pagan art and refinement was shocked by the bluntness of the man who cared more for truth than for its forms. As Lent drew to its close, the audience had dwindled to twenty-five, women and children included, assuredly a discouraging beginning for the ardent champion of faith and virtue in this demoralized center of infidelity and immorality. Nevertheless, he accepted the lesson, while he recognized the cause of his failure, and though his soul flamed with the message he felt that God wished him to deliver, he resolved to retire and resume in the quiet of St. Mark's his commentaries on the Bible, which he then knew by heart. These lectures were primarily intended for his beloved angels, as he called the white-robed boys of St. Mark's, who had come to follow in the way of him whom Dante named the loving minion of the Christian faith, the hallowed wrestler gentle to his own and to his enemies terrible. 
Subsequently, however, as we shall see, others sought admittance and were kindly received. In the Lent of 1484, and again in 1485, Savonarola was sent as a preacher to the little republic of San Gimignano, among whose people simplicity went hand in hand with faith and piety. Strangers to the refinements and the debaucheries of Florence, they listened with reverence and in a truly penitential spirit, as the orator gave free vent to his righteous indignations because of the prevailing sins in Italy. At San Gemignano he foretold some of the cal calamities which subsequently fell upon the land. During the succeeding four years, Savonarola varied his scholastic work by preaching in various towns. In the summer of 1489, his superiors withdrew him from the missionary field and recalled him to St. Mark's. At first he discoursed only to the brethren, but s soon his fame spread, and despite that Lombard tongue, which grated on Tuscan ears, laymen crowded to hear the man whose power they felt, and to whose words they listened as an utterance of one who knew whereof he spoke. St. Mark's could not contain all who wished to share in the lecturer's teaching, Despite his unsparing labors, these were days of rest, of calm, of preparation for the greater labors and for the trials that were in waiting. Thus, as Mrs. Oliphant gracefully writes, the first chapter of Fra Girolamo's history ends under the damask rose-tree in the warm July weather within whose white cloisters of San Marco. In the full eye of day in the pulpit and in the public places of Florence, as prophet, spiritual ruler, apostle among men, was the next period of his life to be passed. Here his probation ends. Five. Lenten Discourses, Prior of St. Mark's, Relations with Lorenzo de' Medici, 1490-1492. Yielding to the urgent requests of the laymen who thronged the spacious cloisters and garden to hear his discourses, Savonarola announced towards the end of the month that on Sunday, August 1st, 1490, he would speak from St. Mark's pulpit, and, as Berlamachi tells us, he added, I shall speak for eight years. He delivered his first discourse, feeling that he had indeed entered on a divinely appointed work. This he outlined in three propositions the spirit of which pervaded his sermons during the entire period of his public ministry. The Church of God, he declared, needs reformation. Italy will be scourged, and these things will soon come to pass. With these propositions as texts, and with the wealth of scriptures as a storehouse from which to draw, he scattered with a lavish hand the gathered fruits of years spent in meditation, in prayer, and in grief for the unhappy conditions prevailing. Swift and fiery was the natural eloquence of the man, who, arguing that mere elegance of diction was of minor importance, disregarded many of the forms prescribed by art. The effect produced on the Florentines by the friar's sermon was notable. Some held him to be a man of God, a prophet, 
Others claimed he was a fanatic, to whose raving denunciation sensible men would pay no heed. That his opponents, as well as his admirers, continued to flock to St. Mark's, overtaxing the capacity of the convent church, proves the extraordinary interest awakened and sustained by the preacher, who vigorously censured the vices of his time, and confidently foretold of the coming calamities, chastisement sent by the God of justice. But great contradictions arose against him, as Berlamachi declares, and we may readily believe. It could not have been otherwise. He had anticipated this. He knew that prophets had been murdered. For himself he foretold the same faith. The friar's study of his divine master has been too loving and faithful to leave any doubt in his mind or in any vain expectation of his heart as to reward awaiting his mission. The Lent of 1491 found him in the pulpit of Santa Maria del Fiore, the Cathedral Church of Florence, generally known as the Duomo, from the Grand Dome, surmounting the splendid pile. The solemn grandeur of this stately edifice, of which Michelangelo had said that, if smaller than St. Peter's in Rome, it was not less fair, as well adapted to the new preacher, for whom St. Mark's had proved too small. Lest the reader should infer, infer that Severanola's audience consisted chiefly of the plain people, we deem it well to state that he had prudently anticipated the objections that scholars might bring against his reprobation of the immoral effects of merely pagan training. To meet the learned, whose false principles he had branded, and to prove that he spoke not from opposition to true culture, but uh, in behalf of the solid erudition and piety, he published several works that soon asserted their just influence over the leading literati, many of whom became his most attentive hearers in the Duomo. Hundreds, we are told, of the people rose at midnight coming to the church where they waited patiently for the opening of the doors. No inconvenience or suffering daunted them. They instinctively felt the goodness, the truth, of the friar who spoke to them, even in terrible sermons. They felt that he loved them, that he wished to keep them from going astray. Every manner of evil was condemned, but particularly the pre predominant sins of the day, gambling, usury, avarice, revenge, impurity. At the same time he exhorted his hearer, hearers to the practice of every virtue, inculcating with exceeding tenderness the duties of prayer, of charity, and of forgiveness of enemies. The contradictions increased. Many thought religiously of the preacher's flaming words, and renewed the spirit of their early faith. Others considered this unhappy state of their city, robbed of her liberty, and hoped that the mighty reformer in religion would also aid in the struggle for civil freedom, while a third party, chiefly among the followers of Lorenzo, threatened to exile the bold stranger. These divided opinions caused a moment's hesitation on Savon Savonarola's part as to the wisdom of discussing political affairs or of announcing prophecies. However, after reflection, 
he resolved to continue. The Lenten course he finished under circumstances that evidenced the esteem in which he was held not only among the people, but among the nominal rulers of the city. Shortly after Easter, on the special invitation of the Signori, he appeared in the palace, and before their excellencies delivered a stirring discourse on virtue in public officials and in the sins of tyrants. It was plain to all that Lorenzo was the man to whom the bold words of the preacher were directed. Nevertheless, the Magnificent took no measures against the friar. In July 1491, Savonarola was elected prior of St. Mark's. He began his administration by enforcing stricter discipline among the brethren. He also manifested his unyielding courage and independence by disregarding a custom which had previously been observed by newly elected priors during the Medician regime. A visit to the prince as an act of quasi-homage and a petition for his favor to the community. He refused to call on Lorenzo, sharply telling those who urged his going that it was to God and not to Lorenzo that he owed his election. Then began a series of efforts on the part of the Magnificent to win over the man whom he considered a stranger in his house, but who would not stoop to pay him a visit? Apparently the first citizen of Florence recognized the metal of the friar, nor could he deny to himself that such a man was worth winning, even if he were obliged to condescend to pay the stranger a visit. Lorenzo was keener in his study of character than were the flatterers about him. He wished, if possible, to win the friendship of a man whom in his heart he admired, even though that man had both attacked and repulsed him. Accordingly, he went to St. Mark several times, and, having heard Mass, walked in the garden. It was natural that the brethren should greet him and show him attention, for his grandfather had built their convent and gratitude might be appropriate and with courtesy manifested to his grandson. Apprised of his presence, Savonarola demanded if Lorenzo had asked for him. Being informed that Lorenzo had not asked for him, he bluntly answered, Then let him go or stay as he pleases. While admiring the spirit of Savonarola, we are tempted to regret that he did not meet Lorenzo. Without any sacrifice of dignity, this could have been effected, as Lorenzo had practically gone halfway. Though thus rebuffed, the Magnificent did not desist from his efforts to see the prior, to win him. Generous gifts were offered to St. Mark's, and gold pieces were dropped into the alms box, to the surprise of the friars. They were further surprised when Savonarola sent all the gold to the good men of St. Martin, a charitable organization, and kept only the silver and copper for the brethren. It must be admitted that the seeming bribe involved in this action of Lorenzo deserved reprobation, if not contempt. He woefully misjudged the new prior, who, as he forcibly put it, would not be kept from barking because his master's enemy had thrown him a bone. Lorenzo next tried to influence Savonarola by sending him a delegation of five distinguished citizens who had been instructed to speak as if they had gone of their own accord. They waited on the prior, 
suggested to him the advisability of abstaining from political references in his sermons, they counseled him to moderate his style, for prudence and for the sake of his community. He listened, and then unhesitatingly told them that they did not speak for themselves, that they were only Lorenzo's messengers, to whom they should return with the answer, I am a stranger and I shall remain. Lorenzo is a citizen, even the first, but he must depart. It was on this occasion that he predicted, in the presence of several, the speedy deaths of Pope Innocent the Eighth, and of the Magnificent. The fulfillment of this prophecy added later to his fame. Baffled by such determination and courage, Lorenzo resolved on a final stroke through which he hoped to accomplish the ruin of Savarano, Savaranola on the public esteem. A certain Father Mariano of the Augustinians had attained some celebrity as an orator of the Florentine school. He was thoroughly classical. Lorenzo urged him to return to his pulpit, and Mariano at once responded. In the church of San Gallo, on the Feast of the Ascension, he announced as his text the seventh verse of the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. It was not for you to know the times or moments which the Father had put in his own power. Building a vehement and harsh discourse on this text, he not only strove to carry out the suggestions of Lorenzo by denouncing recent prophecies, but he exceeded all reasonable bounds by attacking Savonarola as an impostor. Even Lorenzo heard him with dissatisfaction. Others went away indignant and disgusted. Father Mariano lost his hard-won reputation. Savonarola through a masterly answer, increased his fame and influence. Lorenzo made no further attempt either to harass or to win the indomitable prior of St. Mark's. Six, The Deathbed of Lorenzo de' Medici the year 1491 passed away without any other notable occurrence. In the spring of 1492, Lorenzo was prostrated by the disease that had for some time been making serious inroads on a constitution originally vigorous. Though only forty-four, the Magnificent felt that his end was drawing near. Then the faith which had slumbered again began to assert its influence. His heart never hardened in evil, yielded. From scenes of carnival revelry, from the vanity of learning, from the music of his own songs, he turned away. Though he had already made a confession, he expressed a desire to see the prior of St. Mark's, and indeed sent a messenger requesting Savonarola to visit him. The prior went but with misgivings which he expressed. Were it given to historian or writer to read the hearts of those two men as Savonarola entered the apartment of Lorenzo, a picture vivid and dramatic might be drawn. For Lorenzo it was the supreme, because the closing moment of his career. For Savonarola it was an occasion demanding the fullest expression of his high moral courage, the exercise of the most delicate care, charity, and prudence. With differences of detail that leave no one in doubt, the scene in the chamber of Lorenzo, as prince and friar met for the first and last time on earth, is described by historians and biographers. We follow Berlamacci. Father, three sins especially burden me, and I desire to confess them. The sack of Volterra, the robbery of the Monte della Fansuili, and the massacres after the Pazzi conspiracy. Lorenzo, 
Savonarola answered, Do not despair. God is infinitely merciful, and to you will he show mercy if you do three things. What are they? the dying man asked. The first is that you must have strong faith, believing that God can and will pardon you. I do believe, Lorenzo answered. You must also, the prior continued, restore all ill-gotten goods and impose on your sons the obligation of so doing. Lorenzo hesitated, showed how keenly he felt this, but after a while agreed to the prior's demand. And lastly, said Savonarola, as he gazed solemnly and fixedly, fixedly on the magnificent, now so sorry a spectacle, you must restore to Florence her liberty. To this Lorenzo made no answer, only turning his face away. The stern friar then left the apartment. There is much uncertainty as to the meaning and importance of this scene. As tragic, unmatched in history, some would paint it, investing with a living interest the episode of that spring morning more than four hundred years ago, when the Magnificent lay dying in his splendid villa among the beauties of nature and art that he had perhaps loved too well. Even accepting Berlamachi's account, and agreeing with Villari's estimate of its significance, we observe that it is not evident that Lorenzo sent for Savonarola for the purpose of confession. Certainly no sacramental confession was made. Already Lorenzo had been absolved by another priest. May it not have been a desire on his part for reconciliation with the prior that prompted the dying man to send for him? Admitting, however, that Lorenzo intended to seek absolution from Savonarola, it is a question whether the latter's jurisdiction as a confessor extended to the matter of his third demand. Moreover, Lorenzo had his own right of conscience, and apparently he maintained his own view when the matter was presented to him, for previously he did not refer to this phase of the interview, which was exclusively of Savonar Savonarola's suggestion and demand. Such an incident is available for word-painting, belonging, however, to the domain of conscience, and lacking the proofs necessary for the detailed circumstance of the visit. We prefer to pass it over in the silence of charity for the dying man, and without judgment as to Savonarola's rights and powers in the case. Seven. The Friar's Visions, Journeys, Labors, The Reform of the Convents, 1492-1494. Savonarola continued his sermons during 1492, increasing audiences testifying to his growing power and influence. He had found he had a fond love for the fair city of his adoption, and he longed to see her free. But it was the liberty of the children of God, the fruit and crown of holy living, that he yearned for. His ardor for his work was further, further inflamed by two visions which are recorded as having been vouchsafed to him during this year, the one in Lent, the other in Advent. From the city of Rome, on a good Friday night, he beheld a black cross rising to the heavens and extending its dread shadow over the world, while amid lightning and thunder the angry sky reflected back on the words inscribed on the cross, the cross of the wrath of God. Immediately afterwards he saw a golden cross mounting from Jerusalem, filling the heavens with beautiful light, so that the worshipping world, as the people hastened to it, could clearly read the comforting words, 
The cross is the mercy of God. At the close of Advent, the second vision appeared to him. Distinct in the sky he beheld a hand grasping a naked sword, on which were inscribed the words, The sword of the Lord will soon swiftly descend on the earth. While the thunder pealed and the lightning flashed, and arrows and daggers seemed to fall on the world given over to rapine and bloodshed, he heard voices proclaiming mercy to the repentant, punishment to the obstinate, and bidding him warn the people that the divine wrath might yet be averted. During 1492 the prior had visited Pisa on missionary labors, but his absences were brief. In 1493, however, he was assigned to Bologna as the Lenten preacher. Considerable success attended his efforts in Bologna, but he was eager to return to Florence, where, as he had learned, affairs were in a perilous condition. At this time a change was effected that was of great importance to his work. After much difficulty he secured the separation of St. Mark's from the Lombard jurisdiction of the order. This step was taken in conformity with the laws of the Dominican order, and, as a return to the conditions existing previously to 1448, when the Tuscan convents formed an independent congregation or province, this province of Tuscany was restored by the Holy See, and under its own provincial was made subject directly to Master General. Over this new division Savonarola was placed with full ordinary power. Piero had requested this change probably in deference to Tuscan sentiment, and without seeming to understand that it established Savonarola as resident of Florence, beyond the power of such removal as he had hitherto been subject to. He organized the convents under his jurisdiction, according to strict discipline, and so great was the fervor of the brethren of St. Mark's, the center of the reform, so strong had its attractions become, that the building was found inadequate for the accommodation of those who sought admission to the cloister. In a short time this community numbered more than two hundred friars, among whom not only was the study of philosophy and theology maintained at a high standard, but the arts were also assiduously cultivated. Savonarola likewise fostered missionary zeal in an eminent eminently apo apo apostolic spirit, so that St. Mark's was truly the house of God and the home of Christian art and science. In the advent of 1493, Savonarola resumed his preaching in Florence, continuing during the Lent of 1494 the splendid discourses on faith morals, and politics, or rather on the science of politics as founded in religion and conscience. These sermons included the famous series on Noah's Ark, which he had commenced in 1492. Frequently during the year and a half that had elapsed since the death of Lorenzo till the autumn of 1494, Savonarola had announced to the people coming of a new Cyrus, who, as a scourge, would be the instrument of the divine justice. On September 24, 21st, he spoke on the deluge. The Duomo was crowded with an expectant multitude. The preacher's words were as fire. When simultaneously with the thunder of Savonarola's eloquence, the terrible tidings spread that the French king was crossing the Alps to invade Italy, the Florentines were, more than ever, perturbed. <laughs> 